Um, I'm joined by Elizabeth Gould, who's receiving the Benjamin Franklin Medal here tonight, which is a great thrill for us. Um, Elizabeth, I just want to ask you a, a couple of questions uh, um, about your work, but more broadly about the impact of, of um, uh, neuroscience. And I, I wanted to really uh, uh, start with the question that there's an enormous amount of literature now around neuroscience and discussion of the implications that it's got for uh, uh, society. Do you think that our growing understanding of the brain is going to have a really major impact on society? Um, I think I think yes and no. I think many of the things that we're discovering ultimately will seem um, to make a lot of sense. Um, things that, that would be best for people in terms of their brain development and, and healthy brain function are things that seem quite intuitive to us, at least so far. This is what we think. Um, so things, you know, experiences that promote plasticity are experiences that I think most people would say make a lot of sense. Things like physical exercise, low level of stress, rewarding lifestyle, environmental complexity, things like that. So on the one hand, I would say that much of the information that we're getting from neuroscience as it informs policy is really in keeping with many of the things that we believe are good for people in general. Um, but the fact is that knowing that the brain is changed by experience and knowing that the limits, the temporal limits of when experience can affect the brain and um, how long you can go in a negative state and still manage to reverse it, I think that's very helpful. Uh, and I think that ultimately will help, you know, inform us in ways that we didn't know beforehand and enable us to devise strategies to optimize situations for human beings living in many different circumstances. And do you think, I mean, you're associated with, with um, you know, in a way fighting a very brave fight in order to overturn what had been a conventional uh, axiom of neuroscience mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of your work on neurogenesis. I was just reading uh, uh, a new book um, uh, on neuroplasticity, which also seems to be overturning long-established assumptions about certain functions being fixed in different parts of the brain. So do you think that, that, that there are more big discoveries to take place, that there are still sort of certain assumptions that we have about the brain which um, could be challenged by more research? Oh, I think we definitely need more research because we, now we know that plasticity occurs in adulthood and indeed throughout life, but we don't really know what it means for brain function. We have some hints about about the role that plasticity plays in the function of certain brain regions, but we don't know for sure whether it's good under all circumstances. We don't know how to harness that plasticity and enhance it in circumstances where people don't have enough of it, uh, and, and we don't know how to direct it uh, to the right parts of the brain, and we don't know how to use it for brain repair yet. So I think more research is absolutely needed. It's not just a matter of knowing that the brain has capabilities that we didn't believe were true a while ago. We need to understand that the mechanisms that control those capabilities and also we need to figure out ways to actually enhance those capabilities, especially when people are in need. Now, you know, you're a, a very accomplished science, scientist and what I've read of, of you, you, you're very careful about saying that you know, this is the science and it's for others to think about what the implications are of this science. But, the fact is, I, I've heard your name um, and read about your work from a number of people who like to suggest that insights that we're getting into the brain do contribute to a broadly progressive account of how we should order society, that it suggests that um, uh, societies that have strong networks, societies that are relatively uh, equal, that societies where um, everybody has a, a stimulating and low stress environment when they grow up, all these kinds of things seem to speak to a kind of broadly progressive account of how we should order society. Do you, do you find that those kind of connections being made to your work, do you find that kind of embarrassing because you'd rather people didn't make those implications or, or are you excited by the fact that people are thinking, well what does this mean for, for the kind of society which is best for brain development? As long as the things that people are connecting with my work are things that I believe in make sense, independent of neuroscience, I'm not too horrified by it. But I think that it really is the case that you can, you know, you can argue that, that you know, giving every individual access to 
a positive complex environment and a rich rewarding lifestyle and minimizing aversive stressors, that's something that we know is is important regardless of what it does to the brain, what it, what it does to the kinds of things that I study in the brain. Uh, so on the one hand it seems, you know, it seems self-evident. You don't need neurogenesis and brain plasticity to back these these statements up, but uh, I think that I agree with the recommendations, um, I th but I would be arguing in favor of that regardless of my research. One of the things that I think is exciting in this area is that, um, that the traditional boundary between science and social science uh, is being overcome with the emergence of new disciplines like neuroeconomics and social, uh, s social neuroscience. That precisely this process you talked about, which is, as it were, neuroscience confirms what study of behaviour tells us, but then it adds an extra ingredient, then we go back and look at the behaviour, then we come back and look at the brain. That's very exciting, it seems to me, that that traditional demarcation between social science and science is being overcome when these new disciplines are emerging. Do you think that's, is, is, that, is that something that you're involved in, you find interesting? Well, yeah, I, f I think it's one of the, the main strengths of neuroscience is how interdisciplinary it is and how it, it really does, it's, you know, it has far-reaching implications. I think that ultimately we, what we want to do is not just find out what the brain does under cer certain circumstances, but we want to uncover the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And once we know what the mechanisms are, then those mechanisms can be hopefully manipulated in a positive way in order to help people who maybe don't have access to the kinds of experiences that are best early in life or people who have you know, um, disease processes ongoing. Uh, things like that. So I do think that this back and forth is very important. It gives us a lot of information about what this means for humans, especially with regard to the work that I do, which is mostly in experimental animals. Uh, so we do need to go back and forth and understand whether or not this is relevant to the human condition. And then ultimately it feeds back on trying to figure out ways to help the situation, to help the brain when it's in, in a bad state. And then finally, um Thinking a lot about the brain, and I know you, you, you know, you work with um, uh, with animals, mainly with monkeys, yeah. Um, but thinking about the brain as you do, do you find that it actually affects the way that you think about yourself and what you do? I study this stuff all the time, and I can, and I've recently, for example, I've just started doing meditation because I've read so much research that says that meditation is, contributes to your well-being. So I thought, well, if I've read all this research, and it all suggests that it kind of works for you. Now, I'm not asking about whether you meditate, but do you find that reading, okay. <laughs> do you find that, that, that knowing so much about how the brain works gives you, does that affect the way that you think about yourself? Does it affect the way you bring up your children and all those kinds of things? No. No. I think that, the, well, it, with the proviso that, that one thing that I know is true about the brain, especially about the human brain, is that a major characteristic is individual differences. Yeah. So you can't have a blanket prescription for what is, what is the best life for having a healthy brain that applies to everyone. And a good example of this, I, I suppose meditation would be a good one, but a very good example of this, which you know, um, definitely bears on my research, is physical activity. So we know from studies in rodents that physical activity is very good for brain growth that if you give rats and mice access to a running wheel, they'll run you know, one to six kilometers a night uh, unless they're you know, basically on death's door. That mm -hmm. is a universally rewarding experience and it stimulates brain growth, it stimulates the production of new neurons, it stimulates the, the existing neurons to get even bigger. Um, but we also know that this is not a universally re rewarding experience for humans. You know, we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic in the United States if it was, and, and most people use their exercise machines as a coat rack. Uh, <laughs> and many people find physical activity to not be especially rewarding. So that work, I, I think that obviously physical activity is, is, is good for promoting health, and mm. it's very good for the body. And for some individuals it probably is very positive, it has a very positive effect on the brain. But for those people who find it aversive, at least initially, it probably is not such a great thing for your brain. 
which is not to say that I'm, um, right. I'm uh, suggesting people don't exercise. I'm just saying that human beings are much of a much wider range in what they find rewarding and what they find aversive than experimental animals that are bred to be homogeneous in many of their characteristics. So well, part, I because myself... Part of because we're reflexive, of course. That's the other thing that makes us different from animals, is that we have that metacognitive capacity mm -hmm. to reflect about our own thinking. Absolutely. And we also have much more varied experiences throughout life. Right. Laboratory animals live in a very homogeneous, almost deprived state. Um, we have, you know, we're all, we're defined by our, the unique experiences and the accumulation of those experiences. So everybody is different. So everybody has things that they like that are not necessarily the same as what another person enjoys. So getting back to your question, I do not find physical exercise to be especially rewarding. There are other things that I find to be rewarding, and I think that obviously the literature on, um, you know, environmental complexity and rewarding experience in brain growth suggests in a very general sense that engaging in those kinds of activities is, is, is good for you. But we knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a jogger and I'm a meditator. Yeah. I still haven't achieved well-being. Um, Elizabeth, we're really looking forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you.